Okay, my lovelies. Today we're going to be talking about the Spanish Civil War. It's kind of like the last piece on our fascist puzzle before we really get into World War II. So to recap, we've talked a bit about Italy and how Mussolini is our first fascist dictator, El Duce. He marches on Rome and then takes over the Italian government, turns it into crazy fascistism. <clears throat> then, of course, we have Hitler, who sees everything that Mussolini does and decides to do it one step further. And we also saw what happened with expansion between these two countries and how they're expanding throughout Europe. But if you remember from that lecture, we talked about that Spain was also a Spanish country. So today we're going to learn how Spain becomes a fascist nation. And in fact, they will actually be the longest serving fascist nation. In fact, Spain is a fascist country until 1975, which is really long. So a little background, Spain is a monarchy, right? Throughout going all the way back to like the 1400s, all the way into the 20th century. They're neutral in World War I, um, but because of the global depression, people were upset with the monarchy, upset with the decisions that are being made. And in 1931, the second Spanish Republic is established. And Spain is now a republic functioning like a democracy, just like we saw the Weimar Republic, just like we've seen with other European countries. Unfortunately, people are still unhappy because it's the 1930s and the global depression is still happening, as is the excitement of fascism and communism. So in 1936, Spain has an election. And in this election, the Republicans, who also are known as the Popular Front, they win. And the Republicans are going to be the ones that are more leftist-leaning. Um, they're going to embrace elements of communism. They're going to embrace more populist ideas. Um, and they're going to try to turn away from fascism and from the more traditional views. But immediately after this election, a military revolt occurs. Um, and this military revolt against this newly democratic government um, turns into a full-flown civil war. It's fought between these democratically elected Republicans versus the nationalists, who pretty much are the military, as well as some of the more traditional um, people in the government. The League of Nations, that L-O-N, that's a um, cool acronym for the League of Nations, they're going to condemn the war. But as we've seen in the League of Nations, just like in every other time that conflict has arisen, the League of Nations is going to do nothing. So let's talk a little bit more about who these Republicans are. The Republicans are also known as the liberals. So as I said, they're the popular front. They're largely made up of urban workers, so people that are working in factories, agricultural laborers, people that are working in farms, um, and the educated middle class. So basically, it's the lower class in cities and in the countryside, as well as the middle class, so lower and middle class. Now, if you Think back to our discussions on Marxism and Leninism. These are going to be the proletariat, the people that are in the middle and lower classes. So unsurprisingly, they have allies in the Soviet Union, because Soviet Union is run by the proletariat, as well as Mexico, which is kind of random. But remember, Mexico had been a former colony of Spain, so they still have a lot of ties. And Mexico in the 20th century is a hotbed of communism. That's where Trotsky goes when he needs to flee the Soviet Union and he finds welcoming arms in Mexico until, of course, the ice pick that takes him out. Um, and then the International Brigade, which are um, groups throughout the, the um, world who support communism, support the lower classes, support um, this more liberal idea of change. Um, so yeah, so that's going to be our Republicans, our lower middle classes, people that are desiring change, people that are way more supportive of communism than um, the other side. Speaking of the other side, our nationalists, oh, just kidding, um, these are going to be our conservatives. So people that are in the conservative parts of the government, meaning that they don't want change. Um, people that are part of supporting the Catholic Church. Catholic Church does not want change. Conservative means um, groups of people who do not want change. You want to conserve, you know, think about like with science, conserve your energy. You don't want to expend it. So in this sense, conservatives politically do not want to change. And that's to this day when we think about our liberals and conservatives in the United States. Conservatives tend to want to keep things more the way they are or kind of align with traditional values. Same thing here. Oh, cool. Um, that's a great text. Um, so... Um, conservatives 
Catholic Church, they're not going to want change. They want things to be traditional the way they are. The military, landowners, and businessmen. So these are going to be your bourgeoisie, the upper class. They don't want things to change because it's working for them. They're wealthy. So they don't want there to be any change. They don't want to lose any of their wealth. They're led by a man named General Generalissimo Francisco Franco, who, spoiler alert, well, didn't rule the country until his death in 1975. And unsurprisingly, because Franco is a fascist, his allies are going to be the fascists in Italy and Nazi Germany. Um, here's a fun um, Italian propaganda um, all about fascism in Spain down there. So we see kind of the Italian and um, German connection. Um, just to get a sense of how this war is fought, um, we can see that the nationalists um, are basically like taking over the countryside there. So, you know, they start off um, kind of only up in the north and then they circle through and basically take over the entire country. I'm not a military historian. That's all we're going to look at for military battles. But notice the entire countryside um, has battles all around it. Um, so this is a full-fledged war. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit more about the war itself and the effects of the war. So this is a civil war. It's also known as the Red Terror. And that's because terror is used specifically in this war as a means to oppress the opposition. Um, so we know that World War I was a horrific war. Psychologically, physically, men came back completely broken, completely torn um, because of the battles, because of the technology. S the Spanish Civil War, and as we'll see with World War II, um, this is not an unintended consequence, but instead it is intentionally used. So we don't just have brutal fighting just because technology has changed. We have brutal fighting because um, both sides are using it specifically. And why are they doing this? Because, oh, good, y'all, Halloween's tomorrow, great to know. Um, why are they using terror specifically? Because it's a way to get at your enemies. If you can psychologically break down your enemies, if you can make them not want to even fight, not want to even get out of bed, not want to even be able to bear the thought of um, going up against you, you are halfway to winning right there. So terror is used intentionally as a means to oppress the opposition. Um, what does this look like? Executions, murders, assassinations, mass assassinations, mass murders. Um, over 500,000 are killed during the war, although those numbers are actually continuing to grow um, because right now in the 21st century, the Spanish government is still discovering mass burial sites. It's trigger warning, um, but you can see this is actually a photograph of a mass burial site of, um, I don't know if it was the Republicans or the Nationalists, but one side um, were executed in mass and then buried in mass graves. This map down here, that unfortunately now the slide thing is covering, but all these dots are sites of mass graves. Um, and I believe the um, yellow, green is um, something like 100 or less, and then the yellow is like more than 100, and the red is like more than um, like 500. So you can see the entire countryside, I'll move this away, wait for it to fade, or it will never fade, cool. Um, there it goes. So you can see the entire countryside is littered with mass graves. This is a hugely horrific and brutal war. And unfortunately, it's kind of a harbinger for things to come. So what are the results of this war? Again, not a military historian, so I'm not going to tell you about any battles, but we are going to talk about the effects of this war and what it means for the people living in the country of Spain, as well as the rest of Europe and, frankly, the rest of the world. So the results, Franco and the nationalists, they win. Spoiler alert, Franco will rule, like I said, until his death until 1975, which is a long time. So he's going to outlast all the other dictators of the 20th century, essentially. Um, Fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, they're best friends with Spain because they're all fascists, so they're hanging out together. And most importantly for Italy and Germany, they see Spain as a testing ground for new methods of um, fighting on the ground with tanks and mass machinery and mass guns, etc., as well as even more importantly, air warfare. Now remember, Nazi Germany, what's the main part of the army that Hitler's building up? That Luftwaffe, the Air Force, preparing for Blitzkrieg. The lightning war, just lightning, nonstop air attacks and thunder um, and terror. So they really um, practice these strategies in Spain. 
and they essentially use the Spanish people as their own guinea pigs for the war that they know will come. Because Hitler knows that war is coming. He's planning for it. Mussolini, the same thing. Part of the tenets of fascism is that strong countries are proven through war. So they want to go to war. And they want to make sure that when they go to war that they are successful. So they're going to use Spain as their practice for that. Never mind the hundreds of thousands of loss of life um, that is just completely not considered, which is horrible. All right, we're going to now um, shift gears a little bit to talk about one specific element of the war, and that is seen through the lens of this painting called Guernica by Pablo Picasso. Now, I feel like if nothing else, we all recognize Pablo Picasso. He's a famous modern Spanish painter of the 20th century, um, one of the most prolific painters um, that the world has ever seen, true genius. And in 1937, he is in Spain and he witnesses, he hears about what happens in this small town of Guernica and he realizes that he has to act. He cannot paint just um, in his blue period and his pink period and just paint, uh, you know, whatever his heart or, you know, emotionally is telling him, he has to make a stand with his art. And he does it with this amazing piece of artwork, Guernica. Now, you can kind of see here um, in this photograph, this painting is massive. You can see the people here. This painting takes up an entire wall. Um, it's really overwhelming. And you can kind of get a sense from already the terror, the devastation, um, the sheer emotion that is being expressed by this painting. So we're going to talk a little bit about what happened in the town of Guernica and then talk a little bit about the painting itself. So to begin with, kind of to connect back to what we were just talking about, in Guernica we see new military theories are employed. Um, so there's kind of like a two main ideas that are part of these practices that um, Hitler and Mussolini are interested in that plays out in Spain. So the first one is that no one is innocent. Everyone is a target. Now typically when you have countries that are at war, they fight with their armies. So you have your armed forces and then you have your civilians. And it's often thought that the armed forces fight the other armed forces and they leave civilians alone. You try to reduce civilian casualty. Not in the Spanish Civil War and not in World War II. Um, you don't need to write down that German Eric Ludwig because you know that if you see something that's italicized, that means you don't need to write it down. Um, but he wrote this book called Die Total Krieg, which is like the total war, um, which is basically saying that everyone can be targeted. Because if you are killing civilians, that will affect the morale of the armed forces, of the fighters. If they know that their parents, their children, their loved ones are not safe, that is going to affect them emotionally and it's going to make them less likely to be successful. Um, the second part of that, so you're trying to really destroy morale, trying to really kill it, is also using this air-delivered terror. And the Italian um, general Julio de Hu um, comes up with this idea, but really we see it so much in Hitler. We see it all over the Spanish Civil War as well. So that Luftwaffe, again, that air-delivered terror, just nonstop. No one can hide. No one is safe. Um, and Hitler loved both of these ideas because he was a terrible human being for so many reasons. And he decides he wants to test these theories out. Spain is the perfect fertile ground for this testing. Franco knows that Hitler wants to test this out and approves of this. He uses northern Spain because that's where his enemies are largely holed up um, in the northern part of the country. And Franco's like, hey, I have some enemies that need to be taken out. And Hitler's like, I have some new military um, theories that I want to test out, and it is a perfect match, um, unfortunately, for human history. So what happens in Guernica? Guernica is a small town. Um, there's, you know, it's a small town of like a couple thousand people are living there. And on Monday, the 26th of April at 4.30 p.m., the first bomb is dropped on the plaza in the center of town. Now, Guernica is not near fighting. It is its own town. There was a factory nearby on the outskirts of town, but nowhere in the center of town. So it's super important that we're noticing this. 4.30 p.m., plaza in the center of town. What military targets would be in the plaza in the center of town at 4.30 p.m.? Think about what you're doing at 4.30 p.m. 4.30, children are out of school. People are starting to get off work. People are probably going to the center of town to go do their evening shopping. 
to get a copy, to see friends, to see family, to be social, to be human beings, because you are civilians and you are not part of this war. And it is specifically chosen. These civilians are specifically targeted to be attacked. The town is attacked with high explosive and incendiary bombs for over three hours. So from 4.30 to 7.30, it is just nonstop bombs dropping from the sky. There is nowhere to hide. And you can see the devastation in that upper photograph. It's truly horrific, truly horrifying. Guernica is essentially on fire for three days. And at the end of it, over 1,600 civilians were killed or wounded. They were not part of this war. They were not part of the armed forces. They probably had friends and family who were, but these individuals, these men, women, and children, were not part of the war effort, and yet they were specifically targeted. Oh, Ms. Zinkins texted me. Um, and they were specifically targeted for that morale crushing and deliverance of air terror. Now, um, just to give you a sense of one element of that is Guernica, so we can see it here a little bit more. Um, I'm not going to go through all of it, but I encourage you to look into it more or so. Um, but it is important to note that you can kind of see here just the sheer terror, the sheer pain on people's faces. This is truly devastating. And this is incredibly important because Picasso um, exhibits this at the Paris Exposition in 1937, which is a global celebration of arts and technology. Everyone's happy. World War II has not happened yet. People are getting out of the Great Depression. And this is sent, um, seen to be a period or um, an, an event for people to get together and talk about the future. And Picasso turns up with this painting to say, yeah, we can talk about the future, but let's talk about what's happening right now in Spain. What the Spanish government is doing to its own people. What the German and Italian governments are supporting and could potentially do themselves. Um, it is incredibly powerful and one of the most, I think, important artworks of the 20th century, if not of history because it does such an important task and is so intentional to talk about the horror of war and refuses to allow people to ignore it. Remember, this painting is massive. You can't escape it. You can't look away. You can't ignore what happened in Guernica. You can't ignore what happened in the Spanish Civil War. You can't ignore what happened to the Spanish people, and you won't be able to ignore what happens to the Italians, to the Germans, to the French, to the Danes, to the Poles, to the rest of the world. It truly is an indicator of what will happen just a few years later as World War II um, goes into full effect and the horrors of that war to come. So we're going to end on that real bummer of a note. Um, so unfortunately, that is the way that history is leaving us. Um, and yeah, I hope.